Welcome to the Astrocast. Welcome back to the Astrocast. Thank you for joining us this week. It is episode three. It is Monday night and I'm recording. I told myself when I started this project I was going to stick to it. I know that it's uh, you know not always easy going at first. I didn't expect a thousand people to tune in the first couple of weeks. But I will say I've been uh, pretty happy with the uh, progress that we've made so far. I've actually seen that we had two international listeners already. So shout out to uh, whoever gave us a listen up in Canada as well as England. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into the show. That really means a lot. I've also had a lot of uh, friends and family tune in so far. So thank you to all of you for tuning in. So this week, we got a few different topics that I'd like to cover. I kind of teased early in the, uh, or I should say late in last week's episode, that we were going to talk about processing a little bit this week. So this should be an interesting topic for us to get into because I do not consider myself an expert in processing. Uh, but I have used quite a bit of the various software since I started, and I think I've got a pretty good feel uh, for what's best uh, for most people in terms of, you know, what's free, what's, you know, paid software, what sort of plugins are worth your money and which ones aren't. So we're going to uh, start by talking about that today. And then I've got a, a couple other things I'd like to cover towards the end of the episode. So we're just going to take a brief break for one moment and we'll be right back. I am Rue and you're listening to the Astrocast. Welcome back to the Astrocast. I'm your host, Drew. Thanks again for tuning in. I apologize for the uh, audio quality on that first segment there. I had the uh, space heater running in the background. You may or may not know this, but I record this very podcast out of my home office, which is in my garage and is yet to be insulated. So we're in North Carolina, Charlotte to be specific, and it has been very, very cold this past week. We've been down into the teens like a lot of the country has been um, this last week, so been rather chilly, but you know, it's not too bad when I have my little space heater on, um, but I don't like running that while I'm recording because it produces some awful background noise, and as good as Adobe Audition is at removing background noises, I just don't like having a constant hum. It just makes for too many artifacts over the sound, and uh, you know, this is a new podcast, and sounding good is important to me, you know, so I'm trying to keep the quality up so you guys... Uh, actually want to listen to me blabber on for an hour. So that aside, we're talking about processing today. And when I say processing, what I mean in the grand scheme of things is taking your raw photos that you've taken with either your DSLR camera, your mirrorless camera, or if you're lucky, dedicated astrophotography camera, and then turning them into the beautiful photos that you see online. So simply put, processing is really half the battle when it comes to astrophotography. It's very fun to set up your telescope and shoot, but we all know the real work comes when you got to load up the files on your computer and start chipping away at them. Depending on the type of process that you like to put into your work, it can be very quick. You can be somebody who just does, you know, something as simple as deep sky stacker with an auto stretch on it, or it can take a very long time. Uh, it can, you know, if you use Pix Insight and you have a very thorough workflow, it can take several hours to get through processing just one photo. I know uh, this weekend I took a photo of the Jellyfish Nebula on Saturday night. I was out in my uh, driveway. It was a very clear night out. The moon was about half full, so it wasn't ideal conditions by any means, but it was just a, such a pretty night, and it had been a couple of weeks since I'd been able to do any uh, astronomy because of a trip that we recently took, and I just, I wanted to get out there and shoot, so I did, um, and I ended up with about three hours worth of exposures on the Jellyfish Nebula, and when I went to process it the following day, I realized how much time I started spending on processing these files, because I went into the garage around, I want to say around 
around one o'clock to start editing this photo. And I told my wife, you know, hey, I just want to go work on my picture and came in here. And before I knew it, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. And I was not satisfied with where that photo was yet. Honestly, I'm still not quite satisfied with it. So that should probably tell you where I am in terms of processing. It's not to say I can't make a beautiful photo. I've made several photos that I'm genuinely proud of and I've sold prints of them. Obviously, they must like them if they're willing to give me money for them. But we all have room to improve. One thing about astrophotography, it is a hobby that, unlike others, is not easy to learn and difficult to master. It is difficult to learn and extremely difficult to master. There are so many little things that we can get right and get wrong in our process. And when we're getting started as new astrophotographers, I think it's really important for us to take a step back, especially if you're brand new to the hobby and just don't beat yourself up so much if you're not getting, you know, amazing, beautiful photos the first couple times that you go out. I, I think I probably took 10 trips to my dark site before I had what I would even consider a usable photo. So th this is something that is not learned overnight. You're not going to learn the skill of processing photos in a night. But I'm going to give you some tips and tricks today that I think can genuinely help people get started. I'll tell you what I did specifically, what worked for me. I'll tell you all the software that I've used up until now. And, uh, and we'll go over, you know, what I paid, what I didn't pay for, uh, what I'd still like to try in the future, what I have and haven't tried, etc. So we're going to take just a quick break for a moment. And when I get back, uh, we're going to talk about the different software that is available to you as an astrophotographer uh, and what I have used personally thus far. You're listening to the Astrocast. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to the Astrocast. This is Rue. Thank you for joining us this week. Uh, we're talking about processing today and all of the different apps that are available to you, uh, you know, how much they cost, what the processing entails, etc. So I figured I would start with my experience and what I started with versus where I am today and what I'm using. To be clear, I have been doing astrophotography as a whole for a little over three years now. Uh, astronomy, I would say closer to four, as I did start with visual for about a year before I got deep into astrophotography, but that's a story for another day that I'm sure we'll tell at some point. So when I initially started, I worked with Photoshop, and boy, oh boy, did I have a struggle with it. I tried my best to follow along with uh, Trevor's uh, YouTube videos where he was using it early on. I think he uses Pix Insight these days. And I had very little success with using Photoshop. I know what a histogram is. I know how curves work, et cetera, et cetera. I just couldn't get it to work for me very well. And it was such a pain in the neck um, because I knew that I had good data, well, with you know, what I thought was pretty good data at the time. I knew it was good enough to at least show nebulosity. And, you know, I had stars that were sharp. So I knew I had what potentially could be a cool looking image, but I just couldn't get Photoshop to work right. So I was struggling quite a bit with it. And I reached out to a friend of mine by the name of Ryder, who lives in Australia. Uh, shout out to my buddy Ryder from Australia. Hope to have you on the show one day. And I asked him what he was using um, for his astronomy photos, because he was putting up, you know, beautiful, mind blowing photos that, you know, the likes of which I had never seen before. And he pointed me in the direction of an application called Astro Pixel Processor. Again, that is Astro Pixel Processor, and it goes by APP for short. And I think it's still a, a fairly, uh, popular application these days. It certainly is a very user-friendly application, and I think that is probably what drew him to it at first. I know it certainly was a welcome change for me. The interface is set up in such a way that it's it's so much easier to use uh, for processing astrophotography images than something like Photoshop is. There is a column on the left-hand side that allows you to just simply load up your lights, your flats, your darks, bias if you're using them, dark flats, etc. And basically all you need to do is load up all of those files into AstroPixel Processor, and then you can essentially just walk through the five or six steps that they have to calibrate, analyze the stars, register, normalize, and finally integrate the stars. And when it 
finishes with this, all you're doing is basically selecting the default options and clicking next. And once you get to the end, it gives you the option to stretch the image. So AstroPixel will actually stretch the image for you, which for me as a beginner who struggled mightily with stretching images in Photoshop was such a welcome respite. It just worked beautifully for me. So my first several images in astrophotography uh, were processed using AstroPixel processor. Now, I am not still using that tool these days. I haven't used it in quite some time. In fact, I just opened it up and I got an error that my license couldn't be verified. I, I can't remember if it's a yearly license or a one-time purchase. And this is obviously something that we would like to discuss. So since we want to discuss it, I actually paused the recording and snuck away to find out how much it costs. So it looks like I got the renter's license. So there are two different versions for Astro Pixel processor, one being the renter's license and one being the owner's license. The difference in cost is fairly significant. The renter's license is going to cost you roughly 60 pounds per year. The rough equivalent in American is going to be $60. And then if you would like to purchase the owner's license, it is $165. So a little more than double what you pay for a year if you would like the owner's license. So in my case, obviously, I went with the renter's license. At the time, I didn't have a whole lot of money to spend, and I was already pretty darn pinched from having spent quite a bit setting up my very first rig. So $60 was an awesome deal to get access to such amazing software for a full year. It really helped me get started. And I got to say, I probably won't be renewing that license now that I know that it's expired, but it was an excellent tool to get started with for $60, and I definitely feel like I got my money's worth out of it. They also offer a 30-day trial license on their website that anybody is eligible for. So if you're brand new to astrophotography and you know, you've just got your first rig set up and you're taking photos and you need to process them, this might be an excellent way to get started. A 30-day free trial license, that would be a great way to get started. So I'm gonna highly recommend that for a beginners. It is extremely beginner friendly. In fact, I would say it is the most beginner friendly option that there is for processing astrophotography photos. We're gonna get into Pix Insight in a little bit, but that is a little bit more on the complicated side, whereas this is really plug and play. Put your lights in, put your darks in, click go, and you're off to the races. So highly recommend that one. Again, the name is Astro Pixel Processor. It is what I started with. We're going to move on to two more options after the break. We're going to talk about Pix Insight and Cyril. Thank you for listening to the Astrocast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Astrocast. This is your host, Rue. We really need to get some more transitions. I feel like I've been hearing those same two transitions for the last three weeks. And that would be because that's exactly what I've been hearing for the last three weeks. Uh, but thank you for tuning in again this week. Uh, we are talking about processing applications for astrophotography, what they entail, what they cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So before the break, we covered Astro Pixel Processor, which I highly recommended for beginners. And now we're going to talk about a free application. That's right, free as in zero dollars and zero cents. And it goes by the name of Cyril. And to spell that, it's S-I-R-I-L. And their website is actually S-I-R-I-L dot O-R-G, Cyril dot org. Now, this is just as a disclaimer, I have not used Cyril, so it is not something that I have personally used, and everything that I have heard about Cyril has essentially just been secondhand information. But from what I understand, Cyril is a very good beginner's friendly application for astrophotography processing, and again, free. So kind of hard to argue with that. Even for something like Photoshop, which isn't very astrophotography friendly and people still use it, that costs money every month. So, you know, you can't really argue with free. If you're a beginner and you need to, you know, get started in the hobby, this could really be an excellent option for you. So I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. Again, that's Cyril.org if you want to check it out. From everything I've read, it's a little bit simpler in terms of, you know, the tools that are involved compared to something like PixInsight which is what we're going to talk about next. But again, 
it's free. So go check that out. If you're new to astrophotography, maybe you got a smart telescope, something that you want to take your, you know, photos to the next level with instead of just doing, you know, in app stacking or, you know, I'm not sure what ZWO offers or the dwarf or what have you. But if you want to try to take, you know, all of your photos off of your cameras, make them a little bit better, but you're not wanting to spend money on a, you know, big owner's fee or renter's charge or licensing, et cetera, then check out Serial. I think that would be a great option for a lot of people. So that being said, we are going to get into now the application that I actually have the most time with by far, and that is going to be Pix Insight. Pix Insight is not a cheap application. In fact, it is the most expensive application that I have purchased throughout all my years of using APC. I think uh, coming in a close second would be some of the DACs that I purchased back in the day when I was making music. $300 essentially is what we're looking at for Pix Insight these days. I want to say I paid $250 for it when I started using it a couple years ago. I'm not sure if they've gone up on prices in the last year or two, but they may have. I'm not sure. I just checked their website to make sure that I you know, gave you the most accurate numbers and it's coming in at 300 pounds. So, you know, the equivalent of 300 US dollars and, uh, you know, that's not cheap, but you do get a lot for your money with Pix Insight. Now they also offer a, uh, a free trial. So just like APP, you can get a free trial from Pix Insight. I believe you go and sign up for an account on their website. They get your email address and they send you a license code that lasts for, I don't think it's a full 30 days. Let me check real quick. Okay, my apologies. They actually have a longer trial period than APP does. So currently, Pix Insight offers a 45 day trial license of their application. So 45 days is a good bit of time. And let me tell you, you are going to need it before you make a decision because it is a pretty complicated program. The first time that I opened it up, I was completely lost. I had no idea what to do. And uh, it, it was a little bit overwhelming at first, I must admit. I believe I actually started with the trial license for Pix Insight because everywhere I had gone and read online said that it was the best software to use. But after downloading that trial license and just being really overwhelmed. I think that's actually what drove me to use Astro Pixel Processor. So by the time I got comfortable using Astro Pixel Processor and said, hey, let me go check out Pix Insight again, I think that my uh, my trial had actually expired. So I emailed uh, the good people over at Pix Insight and explained the situation to them, and they actually sent me another trial license. So that was very kind of them. So a big thank you to their team uh, for being supportive of the astrophotography community as a whole. I feel like a lot of places wouldn't send you another trial license for 45 days, no questions asked. But they did, and that was very kind of them, and I'm glad they did because the second time that I tried using Pix Insight, I went online and I watched, you know, as many YouTube videos as I could find because I was determined to figure out how this confounding application works, and I finally found a YouTube video that was easy to follow along with. He actually provided sample data if I wanted to use it, but I was using my own data, luckily. And that would be from the YouTube creator, Luco Matico. So you may or may not know, he does a lot of excellent astrophotography content online. And the specific video that I am referring to, if you search for Learn Pix Insight on YouTube, you will see a thumbnail that says, Let's Learn Pix Insight. And the video title is uh, Pix Insight Beginner's Tutorial Part 1. And I believe it says One Shot Color in parentheses because the data that he is using is one shot color camera data. So easy to follow along with. I What I did personally is I found that video and watched it the first time without even touching any of my data. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to follow along. So I opened up my own data and followed his process while using PixInsight. And then I I did that over and over and over again until I got comfortable enough with a workflow in Pix Insight. Now, once you do get comfortable with that workflow, then you can start sprinkling in 
in little extras here and there. Like, you know, I was having trouble getting more color out of the Andromeda Galaxy whenever I had done a really good imaging session on it from the observatory one weekend. And I found a different video online showing PixInsight and how you can bring, you know, a lot of color out of M31. So that's what I did. Over time, you can slowly add to your uh, your repertoire, if you will, uh, in PixInsight and kind of add more tools to your tool belt as you learn the software. Now, part of those tools, if you're using PixInsight, is inevitably going to be paid plugins. So this is one of the often discussed things about PixInsight when people talk about how expensive it is. They say, you know, you got to pay 300 for PixInsight, but then you almost pay as much of as that for the plugins themselves that you got to get. So there are uh, quite a few different plugins that you can get, but I'm thinking the most widely used ones are the RC Astro plugins. So these are plugins like Blur Exterminator, Star Exterminator, and Noise noise exterminator. So they're very, very useful plugins. And the only one that I don't own right now is Gradient Exterminator. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But I did buy those one by one after getting my PixInsight license. So I believe I started with, I want to say it was Blur Exterminator. Yeah, because that one definitely kind of makes the biggest difference in my opinion. It sharpens all your stars up. It really defines your nebulae beautifully. And I think if you asked anyone what their favorite plugin for PixInsight is, they'd probably say Blur Exterminator. It, it just, it's mind blowing what it can do to crummy data. Um, I do not give PixInsight crummy data, to be clear. Um, I like to think my data is pretty good. I blink all of my images one by one, which is a process that basically blinking is when you load up all of your raw images and then you check them one by one for consistency to make sure you don't have like star trails or you know, near the meridian, maybe you got some star trails on your photos. But anyway, even if you do have a little bit of star trails or not great images, Blur Exterminator can really clean them up. And the latest version that came out recently with the big AI update is kind of mind blowing what it can do. It almost feels like cheating because I watched a few demos of people putting in what I would consider unusable photos and they ended up being very usable data afterwards. So, you know, if you're a beginner and you're not having the, the best luck with getting sharp stars, a blur exterminator is going to be a huge help to you. So star exterminator and noise exterminator are the other two plugins that I own. Star exterminator, I wouldn't say that that's a must buy because you can actually get StarNet 2 for free. And that is a very useful application or I should say plug-in for removing your stars from your photo. So why would you want to remove stars from a photo? I, I can hear someone asking. Well, we like to enhance the color of our nebula. We want to brighten them up, you know, bring out the detail, et cetera, et cetera. But we might not want to go crazy with enhancing the color of stars because we want the stars to look as natural as possible. So what you can do with a program like PixInsight is remove all of the stars from the photograph and then adjust your levels on your nebula, if you will, or galaxy and tweak them just to your liking. And then when you get them just where you want them, then you can add those stars back in and then finalize your photo. So Star Exterminator is a tool that makes that extremely easy to do. Uh, StarNet 2, frankly, is also extremely easy to do once you know how to do it. They're both great tools. I ended up getting Star Exterminator just because a lot of the tutorials that I follow followed, raved about it. So I decided to go ahead and buy it. And it's also one of the cheapest plugins, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the final one that I own is Noise Exterminator. Now, this is a great one, in my opinion. Uh, honestly, with the data that I have, uh, looking back, if if you're getting sharp stars and, you know, your raw images look pretty good as is, I might start with Noise Exterminator over Blur Exterminator just because if you've got, let's say, one hour of really good data, 
but it's still pretty noisy and you want to see if you can get a decent image out of it, run it through a noise exterminator and you might be surprised because it couldn't really do a great job reducing noise. Prior to getting that, I was using an app called Topaz Noise Exterminator. Excuse me, not Noise Exterminator. It's called Topaz Noise AI. And that is a uh, different app. It's a standalone application that I used in photography. Uh, as you guys may or may not know, I'm also a wildlife photographer. So denoising photos is nothing new to me, but it it didn't it left a lot to be desired in terms of astrophotography shots. So I ended up going with Noise Exterminator. So talking about all three of those plugins plus Pix Insight, we can now talk about the total cost that we're talking about uh, for this. So drum roll please. Five hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, if you were to just get Pix Insight, Blur Exterminator, Star Exterminator, and Noise Exterminator, I believe you do get actually ten dollars off each of the plugins after you buy the first one. I would probably start with Blur Exterminator and then you know afterwards purchase Star and Noise. Blur Exterminator is the most expensive one; it's ninety nine dollars. Star Exterminator is sixty, and Noise Exterminator is sixty as well. So yeah, it is a lot of money. It's it's $520, but again, nothing in astrophotography is really cheap unless you just want to get a smart telescope. And again, that's still $500. You're going to be spending a lot of money, unfortunately, but if, if it's something that's really important to you and you really want to do the absolute best work that you can in this hobby, an application like Pix Insight is going to quickly become invaluable to you and the $300 will be absolutely nothing to you in the long run. I have owned my version of Pix Insight for a little over a year now, I believe, and I I couldn't couldn't do without it. Um, I'm super glad that I paid what I did for it and I would pay it again. I would pay 300. I believe I paid 250 when I got it, but I'd gladly pay 300 because now that I've used it quite a bit and know what it's capable of and I can see my results that I get, which are pretty awesome in my opinion. And, and I've got a long way to go still, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect by any means. Uh, I've got, a, you know, a lot of work to do where I can improve my images, but Pix Insight is going to give me that room to grow. So that's why it's going to be my number one recommendation for astronomy processing software among all of the ones that we're going to talk about today. Pix Insight is going to be what I recommend. You know, it's not the cheapest, it's not the easiest to learn, but it is the best for a reason, and that's because it's the best. We are going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to talk about a few more things on astrophotography processing that we may not think about right off the bat, but are equally important to things like Pix Insight. You are listening to the Astrocast. I'm your host, Drew, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We are talking about Pix Insight. We just wrapped up talking about the three most popular plugins for Pix Insight, and one that I left off purposefully was Gradient Exterminator. And I will tell you why I am not a big fan of Gradient Exterminator. Uh, let me rephrase that. It's not that I'm a, not a big fan of Gradient Exterminator. It's just that I don't really feel a need to purchase it right now because there are a couple of tools that are readily available within Pix Insight and also outside of Pix Insight that are great at exterminating gradients. So the first tool that is more beginner friendly for people who uh, maybe aren't super used to using Pix Insight yet. It's called Graxpert. That is G R A X P E R T. So like expert, but with G R A X in front of it, like a gradient. And this is an awesome tool that I've been using for quite some time to remove my gradients uh, automatically in Pix Insight. And in fact, with a recent update, it's actually built into Pix Insight in the toolbox. So if you install it and set up the toolbox plugins in Pix Insight, you can actually run the tool directly from Pix Insight, which is a uh, a big upside because Prior to that happening, you actually had to 
save your photo, export it, run it through Graxpert, and then re-import it into PixInsight. And it, sometimes you could get confused with where you're supposed to do it in your workflow, et cetera. And I, I wasn't a big fan of that. So whenever they released the ability to run it right in PixInsight, and they also added, and you guessed it, AI update, things improved greatly with Graxpert. And that's why I just haven't really felt the need to go out and purchase Gradient Exterminator. Now, the second tool that you can use if you're a PixInsight user is going to be the built-in background extractors in PixInsight. Now, there are two different versions that you can use, and I'm only really going to recommend one. Uh, there is automatic background extractor, which is not something that I really recommend, and we'll go over why in a minute. And there is dynamic background extractor, which is a very cool tool that is extremely useful it's it's a lot more complicated than Graxpert is. Graxpert is literally one click and it kind of does all the work for you. But that being said, from what I have heard many people say, dynamic background extraction can get you much better results. So if you're willing to take the time and set all of the individual points on your photo where they need to be for that background extraction to work, which is essentially all the dark spots in your photo that aren't nebulosity, um, then you can get really great results with that tool. And again, that's built into PixInsight, so it's free as long as you've paid for the PixInsight license. And, uh, you know, it, it's a great tool. Uh, Graxpert, again, that is free as well, and you can use that directly in PixInsight. So they're both awesome plugins that have so far negated the need for me to go out and buy Gradient Expert. Now, the, the automatic background extractor tool that I referenced earlier, I haven't had as much luck with. Um, it attempts to automatically look over your image in a very similar, what I would presume, uh, way as Graxpert does, uh, but it just hasn't given me wonderful results. It often produces a gradient in, you know, around the nebula. I don't know if you'd call that a gradient, but... For example, if you have a nebula that's, you know, maybe not gigantic uh, in the middle of your frame, you might end up with essentially like a dark spot around it. That's the most common kind of thing that I see happen with ABE. So dynamic background extraction, awesome tool. Highly recommend that you take some time to learn it if you're a PixInsight user. If you're like me and maybe you're just lazy and you don't have that bad of gradient problems to begin with, then check out Graxpert. Honestly, check them both out. Use them both and tell me what you think. Now, back to what I was talking about earlier uh, when I referenced Luco Matico's video on the uh, PixInsight Beginners tutorial. I wanted to quickly go back to that and just talk about a couple of the links that he includes in that video. He actually links to some extremely useful tools that I still use to this day in my PixInsight workflow. And what those tools are, are the Easy Processing Suite, which is a great set of plugins that you can use in PixInsight to do things like automatically stretch your image for you to get you started before you go in and start manually adjusting your curves. And the most important thing to me is in the uh, the tool set that he includes are icons. So <laughs> in PixInsight, it may not be readily obvious to you when you get started, but you can actually create icons on the uh, desktop page for PixInsight. So it makes it much quicker to go through your workflow. So if, you know, at the top you have your uh, spectrographic photo color correction, forgive me if I said that wrong, SBCC is the short name for it. Um, and, and then after that, maybe you have Blur Exterminator, and then maybe after that you've got Gradient Exterminator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you use those tools frequently, you can create icons for each of them, and that way you can just start at your top icon and then slowly work your way down as you go through your process, which is pretty much exactly what I do when using PixInsight to this day. So highly recommend checking that out. Again, uh, Luca Matico's video is called PixInsight Beginner's Tutorial Part 1 OSC M45. So hopefully you'll be able to find that video and follow along. 
I'm still a little bit new to the show notes. I will do my best to post a link to that video and anything else that we've discussed today in the uh, show notes. So hopefully that will be there for you. Thanks again for listening to the Astrocast. I'm your host, Rue. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about a couple other applications. Thanks. All right, welcome back to the Astrocast. I am your host, Rue. Today we have been talking about processing, and we've covered quite a few different applications and plugins and workflows, et cetera, et cetera. And the last thing I want to talk about are, you know, finishing touches after you've processed your photo in either Astro Pixel Processor, Serial, maybe you're using PixInsight, hopefully you are after listening to me blab on for as long as I have about it. And what I like to use for those finishing touches, and maybe it's just the photographer in me, but I still love using Lightroom to do final touches on my artwork. And that goes for you know, astronomy photos, just as well as it goes for wildlife photos. If I have used a photo at some point, it's likely going to make its way into the Adobe suite. And uh, I don't use Photoshop too much. I have one very specific thing that I like to use Photoshop for, for astrophotography, but it is not something that I include in all of my images. So it's not necessarily something that, you know, I always do. Uh, but Lightroom, on the other hand, is something that I like to use on all of my images because it it offers a ton of simple flexibility for tweaking things, uh, sharpening up the image, maybe adjusting the contrast, the saturation, the vibrance. It's just super easy to use. Um, there's been a couple of situations where I've had like a vignette that I just can't quite get rid of. When I pop into the Lightroom, it's pretty easy to take care of. So Lightroom is something that, you know, if you're past that ultra beginner stage, which is likely zero to six months in your astrophotography journey. If you've gotten into PixInsight and you're starting to get comfortable with it and you're, you know, you're popping out images at the end that you consider to be pretty good, maybe you could look into Lightroom, you know, because it, it does uh, really help me put those, you know, final nice touches on my images. And I do feel like they would be incomplete without it. So uh, Adobe is kind of uh, not the most, uh, what am I going to say here, user-friendly business model. They were kind of early on the subscription trend. They used to have full-time licenses where you could purchase Photoshop or purchase Lightroom and you owned your copy forever. But that, that went the way of the dodo bird with Adobe Creative Cloud and now it is pretty much only a subscription-based service. I use a lot of Adobe's tools and have for years, so I've been a Creative Cloud license holder for, God, as long as I can remember, honestly. I used to make a lot of music back in the day, and I used this very application that I'm using right now to record this podcast to make that music in, which is Adobe Audition. But predominantly, Photoshop, Lightroom, and Audition are the main applications that I use, but if you're also, you know, doing astrophotography, there is another application that you might be interested in called Premiere Pro, and you can use that for time lapse videos. And we talked about time lapse videos a couple weeks ago and how awesome they are. I really like using Premiere Pro for time lapses because it gives you a lot of adjustment that you can make over the various, uh, you know, lengths and color correction, et cetera, et cetera, for your uh, photos, which can be, you know, imported directly into Photoshop. So uh, definitely something worth considering. It's not cheap. I, I think if you do the photography only bundle, it's definitely the most affordable. I believe it's $20 a month for the photographer bundle for Adobe. But if you do the all apps version, it's like 60 bucks a month, which is not cheap by any means. But it is something that I have to have to do my side hustles and business, etc. this podcast. So it's something that I gladly pay for and, uh, you know, a tool that I love to use for my astronomy photos. So I am going to leave Lightroom at that and we are going to take one more quick break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about a few other things. Maybe we'll go ahead and wrap up with the uh, processing part of the day show and we'll go over a few other things. You're listening listening to the Astrocast. I'm your host, Drew. Thanks so much. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Astrocast. I'm your host, Drew. Thank you for joining us this week. We have been talking about 
processing astrophotography images. And when, while we wrap up processing, I just want to briefly talk to you guys about one thing that I see a lot of people beat themselves up over, and that's quality of your images initially. This is not, we talked about it earlier in the episode, it's not easy. You know, don't, don't expect to get mind-blowing Hubble-esque photos when you first start. I remember being like completely blown away when I was able to just see part of the nebulosity of the Rosette Nebula, which is one of the easier targets to capture, you know, as far as astrophotography is concerned. But, you know, I was using an old DSLR camera with God knows how many clicks on the shutter. And when I finally got some nebulosity to show up through my telescope, I was just thrilled. Now, tools have moved along at such a quick clip that smart telescopes are available. You've got things like the ASI Air that can live stack while you're imaging. You know, I don't know if people run into, you know, quite as much difficulty as as might have been just a couple of years ago, but the struggle is still there. This is a difficult, challenging hobby for all of us. And I say all this to say, don't beat yourself up. If you're not getting, you know, great photos right away, please keep at it because it does take a lot of hard work and you will get there. If you just keep working at it, keep watching different videos, keep chatting with your friends uh, who, who may be into astronomy, join your local astronomy club. I cannot stress that enough, people. My local astronomy club opened up a whole new world to me in astronomy. I didn't even know that such a thing existed before I googled it one day at one of uh, my online friend's suggestions who said, hey, why don't you join your local astronomy club? I didn't even know if there was one in Charlotte. Lo and behold, there's, you know, 30 people meeting for star parties, you know, every quarter right down the road from me, you know, an hour's drive and I can see the Milky Way and look through a two meter telescope, well, maybe not two meters, but a very, very large telescope, the likes of which I had never seen before. So there is help out there to be found for those who are willing to seek it. So don't get down on yourself. Keep your head high. Keep working at your goals. And, you know, as long as you're learning, then you're never losing. So keep that in mind as you work your way through this journey. So all that being said, the last thing that I want to talk about today is this great solar eclipse that's coming up in April. I'm curious to see how many of our listeners are going to be able to see this. I know that we've got a few people in Texas. Um, I believe it's been more in the Houston area, and I know one of them. Uh, who has listened to the show. But are you guys thinking about traveling to see this total solar eclipse? I remember back in, gosh, what was it, 2016 when the last one was? Let me check. Okay, it was 2017. So it was August 21st, 2017. Prior to that, it had been more than three decades since a total solar eclipse. That happened in 1979 before I was born. Now, at the time, I wasn't very big into astronomy and honestly i thought eclipses were a more common thing and depending on where you are in the world you know there's always one happening somewhere in the world be it a partial or a total uh every year but you know in north america exceedingly rare so to give you an idea generally speaking at you know some point on the planet earth Every year or two, generally, you're going to have a solar eclipse happen somewhere. But most of us can't travel to anywhere on planet Earth. So those of us that are in North America know that this is going to be the last eclipse for several decades. And a lot of us probably won't be here for another one. So what I will say is that if you are within an eight-hour drive of totality you would be crazy not to go see it because when I saw it in 2017, I was very lucky it passed pretty close to Charlotte. We only had to drive about an hour and a half down to South Carolina to get into the totality area. That was a life-changing experience, guys. When the sun goes dark in the middle of the day, it was silent 
like 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 a silence I'd never heard before. And we were all, you know, waiting and watching with anticipation. We had our cheesy solar glasses that everybody had a hard time finding in the last few weeks leading up to the eclipse because it was all anyone was talking about. And luckily I was able to snag a couple of pairs uh, from a friend. But I just remember just this this crazy sense of awe and peace whenever it finally happened. I was staring up at it with my wife and I I had my camera and I got this one really beautiful video of the clouds passing over the sun and then they split and faded away for a moment and it just looked like a it looked like a diamond ring is what it looked like. Just all black with just a diamond of light on top of the sun. I say all that to tell you that not unlike seeing the Milky Way for the first time, experiencing a total solar eclipse is also a rather spiritual experience. So if you can make your way to it, it's going to be, like I say, in April, and it's going to be passing through a large chunk of North America, I would highly encourage you to do it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it, unfortunately, April 8th, 2024. I I wish I had planned way ahead. I wish I had a hotel somewhere. I've known about it for quite some time, but just where I'm at in life right now, I don't think I can, you know, up and leave and drive two days to go see this eclipse. Eh, Maybe I could make it in one day if I picked the right area. Looks like Ohio is probably the closest area to North Carolina that I could get to to see totality. But, you know, if you are in those areas, go see the eclipse, please. For the for, for all of us who can't go, please go and see it and, you know, take videos, bring solar glasses. If, if you don't have those, get those now because in the weeks leading up to that eclipse, they're going to be incredibly hard to find. I will drop a couple of spots where you can get those. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going somewhere like Amazon. I would check out like High Point Scientific would be a good place to go online. And I'm sure they sell solar viewing glasses and they're, they're not expensive at all. I actually have a couple of pair that I ordered from them not too terribly long ago just so I can have them on hand. But yeah, definitely get your solar glasses ahead of time so you're ready to go. And like I say, if you're within a, you know, an easy day's drive of the total eclipse area, definitely go because you you don't know if you're going to be here 30 years from now when the next one happens. I, I you know, I don't know. Here, let, let me check and see when the next one is. Okay, so the next one after April 8th, 2024 is going to be August 23rd. 2044. So think about that for a minute. 2044. It's going to be 20 years before many of us will have the opportunity, likely most of us will have the opportunity to see another total solar eclipse. So if you can go, go. Definitely go. It looks like the regions that are in the south have the best chance of not having clouds. So like, you know, Texas and that region is going to be your best chances. I cannot imagine the heartbreak that I would feel if I traveled two days to get to a solar eclipse location only to find clouds in the sky. What I could say is that I would have backup options if I were planning this trip. I would probably pick three different areas that are six hours apart from each other ideally i wouldn't necessarily book a hotel at all three of them maybe you could go online a lot of hotels give you free cancellation up until a couple of days before you arrive and you know you could book a hotel in two different cities check out the 10-day forecast check out the historical trends and just plan as best as you can when i made my last dark sky trip we planned out as best as we could in advance And I think we did a pretty good job of monitoring the weather because, you know, we were going during a time of year when hurricanes are not uncommon. So we lucked out big time. We had clear skies the whole time. It was wonderful. So, you know, look through the historical data to see when, you know, clouds and rainfall are common in these areas and try to pick an area if you can. Texas would be a a good place because it looks like historically they have the fewest clouds in the path of totality. Definitely check that out. 
And uh, I, like I say, just highly recommend going. You won't have another chance for 20 years. And it is a mind-blowing experience to see a total solar eclipse. So going to take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to wrap up today's episodes. Just got one more thing to talk to you about. You are listening to the AstroCast. I'm your host, Rue. Thanks so much. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the AstroCast. I'm your host, Rue. Thanks again for joining us this week. And we are going to start a new segment that we're going to end every week's show with, and it's going to be a weekly recommendation. So the recommendation could be a target that I would recommend that's great for this time of year, or it could be anything else. Maybe it's a book, maybe it's a website, maybe it's a YouTube channel. But this week, our recommendation is going to be the Jellyfish Nebula. That is IC443. That's its catalog name, but it is colloquially known as the Jellyfish Nebula. I have been seeing a lot of shots of it online over the last couple of weeks. It's in a great spot in the sky right now this time of year. It's nice and high up near the zenith when it's not too late at night. So if you get out, you know, just after astronomical darkness occurs and start imaging, you can get, you know, several hours worth of exposures before it gets lower on the western horizon. And it's just a really cool target. It's a large nebula. Um, It'll show up great in a lot of different size telescopes. You know, I, I do wide field imaging personally at 448 millimeters predominantly. But if you've got an even wider field of view, it'll look awesome on it. And there's other targets that are nearby that you could capture. If you were using something like a Rokinon 135 uh, or even, you know, something in the 200 millimeter range could work great on it. And you could even get closer if you wanted to use anything from 600 to 1000. I'm sure you could get excellent results on IC443. So that is the Jellyfish Nebula one more time. And then since it is the first week of our recommendations, I am also going to have a a second recommendation, which is not something I do too often. But this one is near and dear to me, and it is a book. And the book is The Last Stargazers by Dr. Emily Lebesque. She is my personal astronomy hero. I think she's absolutely awesome. She actually wrote this book herself. It was released a few years ago in 2020, and I actually got the audiobook version of it. I'm a big fan of audiobooks because I have more time to listen than I do to actually sit down and read. And in fact, listening to audiobooks is one of my favorite things to do while I am doing astronomy. So The Last Stargazers is an awesome book. It's obviously about astronomy, and I wish there were more books about astronomy because unfortunately, it's such a, a niche hobby that there aren't too many. If you ever go out and try to find books about famous astronomers, you're going to have kind of a hard time. But Emily has done an absolutely wonderful job bringing lots of awesome stories together about people who have discovered things all the way back from Galileo to more recent discoveries. Um, Highly recommend you check out her book. Uh, You won't regret it. And if you like audiobooks, you will love this one. She has an awesome voice. She narrates it very well. And she just, uh, she does an excellent job with the writing. And I just, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you uh, listen to all of that and you still want more. Dr. Levesque actually has a master class available on Audible. I believe it's called The Great Courses and she discusses astronomy and she actually talks a lot about the same things that she talks about in her book but gets very very deep in in detail with the history of astronomy. So definitely recommend you check all of her work out. Again her name is Emily Levesque and that book is The Last Stargazers. So that is going to do it for this week's AstroCast. I want to thank everybody for joining in for these first three episodes. I hope you're excited for what's to come. I promise we're going to have another guest on the show soon. You won't just have to hear my voice forever. I do have plans to have quite a few different people on the show, so that is coming. Stay tuned. But we've got week three done. I hope that you get lots of clear skies. I know new moon is right around the corner as soon as this full moon gets out of our way and then we can be back out there under the stars so thanks again for tuning into the astrocast i'm your host rue clear skies